afternoon. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Langebacher. I am the uh, director of the Society, Culture, and Politics program uh, here at uh, the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies. And it's really my great pleasure today to um, welcome our panelists and our moderator. Uh, we're going to be uh, speaking about the status of the Social Democratic Party of Germany, the SPD, today. Um, this is part of a year-long project that AICGS is um, embarking upon that will look at the 2021 Bundestag election, which is coming up in September. So we've already had an event on the Christian Democratic Union. Uh, today, we are dealing with the SPD. On March 1st, I'm happy to announce we're going to have a webinar on the Alternative for Germany, the AFD, and then later on, on the Greens and a variety of other election-related issues. So I really wanna um, thank quickly our collaborators um, on this project. Uh, we have the um, Aston Europe Center. We have the um, International Association for the Study of German Politics, as well as the BMW Center for German and European Studies at Georgetown University. But without further ado, I'd like to hand the floor over to uh, Professor Jenner, Jennifer Yoder, who is the Robert E. Diamond Professor of Government and Global Studies at Colby College up in Maine. Uh, she's the author of numerous articles and two books uh, entitled From East Germans to Germans, The New Post-Communist Elite, as well as Crafting Democracy, Regional Politics in Post-Communist Europe. Uh, her research examines political culture and identity in post-communist societies, uh, the integration of Eastern and Western Germany, as well as nationalist populist challenges to Holocaust-centered memory in Europe. So Jen, thank you so much for um, uh, participating today. Uh, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Eric. Um, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. It is my pleasure to introduce our two speakers for today. First will be Jana Faus, who is the co-founder of Politics Research, Strategic Research, a research-based consulting agency focusing on polling and issue management. She has more than 15 years of experience in the field of social science and political consulting and has published numerous studies on politics, society, and election campaigns. Jana has co-authored Aus Fehlen Lernen, Learning from Mistakes, which is an analysis of the SPD's election campaign from 2017. We also have today with us Ed Turner, reader in politics at Aston University and based in the Aston Center for Europe. Ed has published widely on German politics and is currently undertaking a research project on the SPD funded by the German Academic Exchange Service. Um, and the background might, might also hint at uh, a, a side interest of Ed's, I, I believe. Uh, he is a, a referee for semi-professional football, maybe somewhere out there, I picked that up. Um, and uh, we will start with Jana. Jana and Ed will each speak for about 12 or 15 minutes, and then we should have about half an hour for questions. Please. Well, thank you very much. Um for inviting me for the nice introduction and the possibility to talk about the SPD today. Um, I've seen in the invitation, it said, well, um, the last election since uh, 2017, um, the SPD is actually doing a really good job um, when we are talking about the policy um, level. However, you know, the numbers are falling and it's actually not um, manifesting in anything. So I'd argue actually it's a bit, Jumping too short when we only look at this very short period between 2017 and today, because what we can see um, starting from 1949, which is quite a while ago, um, the SPD was always quite strong, but it was a three party system, more or less. Um, and it had its greatest results in 1998 with Gerhard Schröder, and then the lowest result, um, in, or really low result in 2009 with. Um, Steinmeier, who's now a president of Germany, so um, he's, he's still quite, quite successful. Um, and in 2017, the lowest results with Martin Schulz. So um, when we look at the period since 1998, sorry, what happened? Why was the SPD um, such a you know such a fall in this whole period? It, I think it basically has two reasons hard sphere um, which is still seen as quite 
unpopular and um, still seen as one of the one of the most or the biggest issues the SPD has, which I don't believe is the most important issue anymore. Um, there are new issues coming um, on top of that. But the second thing um, is basically Merkel, who moved a conservative party from the right wing, so to speak, to a more moderate um, place in the center, which kind of was opening up um, the right wing as well, and kind of paving the way for the AFD, which you can see in 2017 um, being in as well. What she also did, she always um, followed the strategy of asymmetric demobilization, basically saying she's taken away um, classic social democratic issues um, and given SPD voters no real reason for casting the vote. So when we look at the period between 2009 and today, um, at the very beginning, you can, you can see the coalition, Merkel formed a coalition with the Liberals in 2009. Um, this coalition, however, was quite unpopular. And what you can see at the beginning, um, you do see a rise and um, quite an appetite for social democratic and green um, politics. So there was an appetite for progressive politics. Um, and then you can see, you know, this big jump for the Greens was Fukushima. And what's quite interesting there, um, in what, what did Merkel do? She again followed um, her strategy of demobilization. So she actually took away the most important issue um, for, of the Greens and basically shut down the nuclear power plants. Um, and you can see the Greens, you know, shuffling along um, around 10 percentages. And then you can see in 2016, where you have this big rise just before the 2017 um, election, again, an appetite for social democratic politics or probably more Martin Schulz, who was really hyped as a um, candidate, chancellor candidate. And however, he did not live up to expectation. It kind of, you know, everything went downhill from there again. So um, the SPD basically in 2017 and Martin Schulz, he did not show any future competencies. And we look who, which, which, what, that, which ground does he lose? He lost most ground when it comes to female voters, when it comes to urban voters, when it comes to young voters. So he clearly did not show, you know, he, the SPD was not standing for anything what is concerning future issues and future concerns. Um, when we now look at you know what the Greens did, there was a slow but steady rise um, of the Greens, which was basically Friday for Fridays for Future, who kind of put this um, crisis on top of the agenda. And the Greens started being the new focal point of not only green um, politics, but also progressive politics. It was not the SPD anymore. And when you look at the what happens in the lender, I think Ed will uh, talk about this a little bit later. Whenever you know the Greens started to become the focal point, the SPD started to becoming squeezed between the Conservatives and the Greens, basically happening in Berlin, but also in south of Germany, whilst in the east of Germany, the left being still the focal point. So the SPD is, is being squeezed between the left and the uh, Conservatives here. So um, what to do, where to go from here? So what we've kind of looked at the coalition options um, based on polling um, numbers since 2017 till today. The left-hand side you do see, or on your right-hand side, I don't know, you, you do see the coalition between the Conservatives and the Greens. Basically, you know, always being underneath the threshold um, until all of a sudden the Greens, you know, being more and more popular and now the crisis kick in. So that's actually quite a safe bet. Um, so they will quite surely be um, able to form a coalition um, in 2021. So what is happening for the SPD? What kind of coalitions can they form? So we do see three different possibilities here. One is the grand, option, uh, grand coalition here. Then we do have one between the Greens, the Liberals and the Social Democrats and between the Greens and the left and the Social Democrats. And here from 2017 onwards, the Grand Coalition was always quite um, steady. It was always you know, working well. However, all the others be stayed below the threshold 
just until um, just before the crisis and now Corona kicked in. So um, one might argue, well, if we move the SPD towards the green um, positioning, we basically need to be greener than the greens. Is that what we want to do? And what, what kind of um, coalition options do we still have then? What we see here is between 2017 and 2021, what was the most important issue today? So it was, you know, that was all refugee crisis, refugee crisis, refugee crisis, until it, you know, being replaced by the climate crisis. And all of a sudden, now here we are seeing a health crisis, Corona. So what, you know, time for crisis is always kind of time for leadership. So what we could say, it all paid in for leadership for Merkel, not for the um, coalition, but it was Merkel, Merkel, Merkel. She is, even after 16 years in charge now, still the most popular figure in Germany. She's still the most popular politician. However, it's the first time now that we wait um, an office holder running for office again. So that will be a great game changer. So this guy in the middle, Armin Laschet, is now the new party leader. However, I think there might be doubts that he has the personality or let's say her footsteps might be a little bit too big for, for him. But you could also argue maybe um, uh, Zuda might be the one who's running for, for Chancellor. We, we don't know yet. He definitely will be what you know a leader um, is, is, is expected to do. But um, again, he has quite a lot of um, difficulties. So that will be um, one of the uh, big game changes. Because the SPD, at least, you know, it's running with the vice chancellor, um, Olaf Scholz. He can, you know, he has solved this crisis. He's quite um, successful doing that. However, the question still is, does he have enough ideas for the future? And does he have enough progressive thinking to replace the new focal point of progressive thinking, the Greens, um, with the SPD? So, thank you. Um, and I try to stop that. Here we go. Thank you so much, Jana. A lot of food for thought. And I turn it over to, to Ed, who I know has some slides as well. Yes. Great. Uh, thanks very much indeed, everyone. It's uh, great to be here and um, uh, yeah, real, real honor. Um, and uh, yeah, if I, um, uh, I hope everyone sort of recovered from uh, five days of uh, virtual carnival. Um, I, I sort of entitled this three, just seven quick claims uh, about uh, which are intended to be a little bit provocative about the position of the SPD at the moment. The SPD, of course, uh, sometimes uh, going under the, I think, affectionate nickname Alta Tanta, uh, Old Auntie, although, of course, uh, perhaps there's something in there, a little hint that maybe it's not doing so well on some of those uh, forward facing future uh, themes that uh, Jana was alluding to. Um, so uh, my first claim uh, is that really the challenges of the SPD aren't unique. Um, if I think about the dilemmas faced by uh, social democratic parties uh, or parties of the centre and centre left, let's say in the United States, uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, certainly across Western Europe, um, the challenge of marrying a previous, uh, if you like, core vote, um, uh, uh, maybe manual working class voters on the one hand with more highly educated urban liberals is certainly uh, not, not, not an unfamiliar one. Um, uh, and indeed, you know, holding together those different constituencies, sometimes with divergent interest, um, is, is a familiar challenge. Um, but where I think uh, the SPD is in a uniquely, or not uniquely, but an unusually difficult position um, is that Germany has a very crowded centre ground um, with, with the CDU in particular and the CSU pivoting to the centre in just the way Jana described, and also the Greens fishing in that pool. Um, there is a right flank uh, which, is, which, is, which is well covered. I think there's something of a myth out there that uh, the AFD uh, is, is receiving a lot of previous social democratic support, and certainly current AFD voters don't show any sign uh, of giving the uh, social democrats a look. But the right flank is well covered. Um, the urban liberal uh, uh, green interested uh, area is certainly very well covered uh, by the Greens and, and of course uh, also uh, some of those uh, it may be in, in more precarious sections of society, <coughs> those, excuse me, those on lower incomes, those who maybe lost out from the Hearts reforms 
also um, uh, may well be g giving the left party a look. So it's it's a really crowded uh, a party system, which I think exacerbates the uh, challenges that the SPD uh, faces compared to other uh, social democratic parties, all of whom are grappling uh, with these issues. That's the first claim. Um, the second claim, um, uh, and actually, again, this was one of Jana's starting points, is that the SPD has done consistently well, certainly in the last eight years, in terms of policy. There's a shopping list of really impressive achievements, particularly in the area uh, of social policy, uh, but it's got relatively little credit for those. So if you think about the uh, the previous uh, coalition gov grand coalition government, a minimum wage introduced for the first time in Germany. Has the SPD really got any credit for that? What should have been a, a really important moment? Uh, it feels to me like it hasn't. And if anything, a, a good chunk of the credit arrived with Angela Merkel. Or if you look at this time, uh, whether it's legislative changes around pensions or, or, or the uh, pay packets of lower paid workers, um, or, or protection of uh, workers' employment rights for workers in precarious jobs. Again, there's been some real uh, substantive policy shifts there under the current coalition, but the SPD's uh, achievements have been rather overlooked. And I think there's something there which, which, which is always quite difficult for a junior coalition partner. Uh, my, my third claim, and I suppose this is the, the crux of my argument really, is that therefore the SPD risks being a Volkspartei without a folk. Uh, what I mean by that is, is this, that uh, when I think about a Volkspartei, I think about a party which looks for a cross-class, cross-sectoral appeal. So it's looking uh, to, 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 to appeal to many different sections of society. Uh, but I'm not sure that that really flies in such a crowded party system as Germany currently has. And instead, there may be choices to be made, and they will be conscious choices which would increase support among some groups, but you'd have to accept that other groups may be less likely to support you. And there would be various viable options. So there was an, an interesting uh, article in the uh, Tagesspiegel the other day pointing at the model of Denmark, where the Social Democrats have pursued a more restrictive line on immigration than, than the SPD, I think, would currently be comfortable with. Or there's a kind of green left positioning uh, where the SPD would seek once again to be competitive amongst some of the voters, uh, sort of uh, educated urban liberal voters who may have gone in the direction of the Greens. The risk is if you don't take any of those strategic choices, then potentially you don't cut through at all. You're pursuing the strategy which might work well if you're hovering around 40% of the polls, but which is not very attractive when you're hovering around 15%. Um, and you're everybody's second or third choice, but nobody's first, first choice. I think there's also a further challenge here around the rather complicated leadership arrangement. Um, as people uh, will, will perhaps know, the SPD currently has joint party leaders, Norbert walter Boyan, Saskia Esken, associated with the party's left, who defeated uh, Olaf Scholz and, and his running mate, Clara Geiwitz, uh, in the SPD's leadership election. Uh, but since then, uh, Olaf Scholz, who's, who's certainly had an effective crisis as federal finance minister, has been nominated as a chancellor candidate. And there's a couple of risks there. I mean, one is that the SPD risks facing in two directions and not being able to forge a, a clear profile. Another is says, I think, maybe a bit of a risk of inauthenticity. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and at times that happened in previous election campaigns as well where there was a more left-wing election program with quite a centrist chancellor candidate, maybe it didn't quite ring true. And so I just wonder whether it would be possible if you get a, an election manifesto largely written by uh, Norbert Reiter Boyan, Saskia Esken, and Olaf Scholz is representing that, I'm just not sure how well that will fly. Um, a fourth claim, um, uh, and uh, I've, I've made terrible mistakes on this sort of thing in the past and made projections about coalitions that have been completely wrong. So um, people can play the recording and taunt me in a year's time if I, if I make a mistake here. But I think it's really hard to see the SPD being in government after 2021. Um, the, the, log the way in which it could come about, I suppose, is a red, red, green coalition. So a coalition between the SPD, the Greens and the left party. I, I think there's a, a problem here. I mean, I, I put here a little photo um, of, uh, 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 from, from the website of uh, Sevim Dagdalin um, of, of the left party, um, a, a member of parliament who speaks on foreign affairs issues. And um, for those who can't read German, she says NATO is morally bankrupt. This uh, expensive um, uh, warmongering alliance should be dissolved. That doesn't look to me like someone who's pitching for a part in a coalition government uh, under Olaf Scholz, uh, or for that matter, under, under the Greens. 
Uh, and from what I understand, the likely composition of the left party's parliamentary group after the elections is such that there would be a significant number of people uh, who really wouldn't be looking to entertain policy compromises with the Social Democrats and Greens. I think the prospect of red, uh, red green will still be talked up, and there are good reasons for almost everyone to do so. For the SPD, it gives them some sort of perspective where they can make a credible claim that they can, uh, they can win power, rather than having a chance for a candidate but looking ridiculous because they're polling at 15%. Um, for the Greens, it might increase their leverage over the CDU, CSU, because they can say, well, look, we do have an alternative. For the left party, it may make them seem more relevant. For the CDU, CSU, actually, um, threatening the country with red, red, green is also not unattractive, but I don't think it's a very realistic prospect in practice. Another possible uh, way to stay in government for the SPD would, it seems to me, have been if there was a, uh, an attempt to form, or if there were an attempt to form a CDU-CSU Green government after the elections, but negotiations broke down. Since Friedrich Merz, um, who, who's a more hardline Christian Democrat politician, was not nominated um, as the uh, part CDU's leader uh, and as a likely chancellor candidate, I think it's less likely that that will happen. Um, uh, and it's more likely that the Greens and the uh, CDU-CSU uh, will reach an alliance. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the last point uh, I'd make is that we should no longer view the SPD as the natural partner of choice for the Greens, and indeed it probably suits them to pivot um, so that the CDU is just as much a natural partner. I was very interested in, in, in last year's North Rhine-Westphalian local elections, for example, in, in Dortmund and in Düsseldorf. The Greens, when there was a runoff between a Christian Democrat and a Social Democratic candidate, the Greens actually weighed in and endorsed the Christian Democrat. Um, and, and of course, there have also been a number of coalitions between the CDU and the Greens at the state level. So, so those are all reasons why I think it's relatively unlikely that the SPD will be in government after 2021. If you buy that claim, um, then what happens while well, they go into opposition? And this is my fifth claim, uh, that opposition will not be a panacea. I mean, sometimes in the internal debates of the SPD, uh, one had the impression that uh, there, were, there were people that believed if only the SPD can go back into opposition, other people have the responsibility, they will automatically go up in the polls. I think there are good reasons for believing that won't be true. If we look at the history of CDU Green coalitions, um, perhaps an exception being one in Hamburg, which didn't go so well, uh, but, but they've tended to be relatively robust and certainly the Social Democrats have not really profited. So in Baden-Württemberg, where there's a Green CDU coalition, the SPD polling around 11%. Uh, in Hesse, uh, where uh, there was a uh, CDU Green coalition, 2018, the elections happened, the SPD went down another 11%. So that's certainly not a panacea. And I think a further challenge uh, in terms of being in opposition is the SPD won't be completely out of government. Uh, Germany's second chamber, the Bundesrat, where the governments of the states, the Länder, are represented, will still have a good amount of SPD representation. So on the bottom right of the screen, you'll see the current uh, composition of the Bundesrat, and you'll see plenty of red there. And so uh, there'll also be some necessary involvement uh, of Social Democrats in legislation. And so, again, a sort of more vigorous form of opposition, I think, would be quite difficult to achieve. Um, again, throwing from that, again, if you, if you buy my claim that the SPD is likely to end up in opposition, and then you assume that probably the current leadership um, uh, will move on, um, it may be difficult uh, to renew personnel, particularly if that's associated with a change in course. So some of the front runners to lead the party uh, in the event that, that happens would be uh, Manuela Schwesig, the state premier in uh, mecklenburg lower Pomerania, Lars Klingbeil, the general secretary, Stefan Weyer, the state premier in uh, Lower Saxony. They're all quite pragmatic. They're all to some degree associated maybe with the kind of previous regime. It wouldn't necessarily have the feeling of renewal and certainly a pivot into a more green left uh, uh, space would I think be quite difficult to sell. Um, and then there are other problems which just flow from losing seats, um, particularly in the German system. So as you shrink in the polls, there's more people looking inwards, scrabbling over good places on the list uh, because you stand little prospect of winning seats directly. Also means there's less room for new faces because uh, in practice, city MPs uh, will, will be looking to occupy the uh, uh, promising places on the list. You'll miss out on direct seats. Maybe that gives you uh, that little bit less profile uh, and may also push you in a less pragmatic direction. Making appointments according to where someone comes from, in particular regional proportionality, what we sometimes call poport, uh, is perhaps less appropriate. It means you may end up with uh, people filling the wrong roles. Um, 
Uh, and of course, also the party in a system where there's state funding and political parties will lose out on funding and will also lose out on patronage. So that then also uh, uh, makes life, I think, more difficult. And, that, and then, then, the, then the final claim, and perhaps this is a more optimistic note uh, for those who are sympathetic to the SPD, I don't see the SPD going the way of PASOK. Um, uh, it, it seems to me that the SPD, uh, notwithstanding the current difficulties, will uh, remain part uh, of the furniture of uh, German politics. There are for sure uh, significant uh, issues which Jana highlighted really clearly. I mean, the fact that the SPD is barely relevant in parts of the East, in Baden-Württemberg uh, and in Bavaria, uh, is a real problem. Uh, and in particular, uh, as Jana very powerfully put it, uh, younger voters uh, seem to be a real issue at the moment. I, I looked at the uh, European elections in 2019, 8% amongst 18 to 24 year olds compared with 24% amongst the over 70s. You know, those are not clever, 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 clever numbers. But at the same time, uh, of course, we shouldn't forget that the SPD retains some strength in some of the lender. It was only last year that it won a state election in Hamburg and also in parts of local government. So uh, that does give it, I think, a, a significant base. Um, and it seems to me that the uh, upcoming state election in Rhein Palatinate, where Marlou Dreyer on the bottom right of the screen is a really popular, uh, effective minister president, you know, stands a decent chance uh, of winning that election. Also in Mecklenburg Lower Pomerania on the same day as the, as the federal election uh, will probably point to the fact the SPD uh, has fallen quite a long way, but still I think will remain a really relevant force in German politics. And I'll wrap up there. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Ed. Um, beautifully covered a number of issues, uh, both of you, um, and did it very punctually. Thank you. Leaving plenty of time for questions. Uh, we've already got a couple in the queue, um, so I'll, I'll go right to them. Um, and our, our speakers probably don't want to uh, bother looking at the queue, so I'll, I'll try to, to um, summarize, but, but this one might bear reading a little bit. Um, it has to do with uh, leadership, the party leadership being um, primarily of older generations and possibly blocking younger talent. And Mark Kossel of Kent State gives us an example from Bavaria, um, Philippa Siegel-Glockner. So would either of you, Jana or Ed, uh, care to address how young reform-minded SPD members might be blocked by some of the older party leadership and um, what impact this might have on 2021. Well, um, in 2021, we, don't, we do not only have the federal election, we actually do have quite a lot of elections um, in Germany um, coming up in Länder, but also on the regional level. So, um, and I, I totally agree with whoever asked this question <laughs> that there is kind of a you know a ceiling where you just can't get can't seem to get through as a um, young party member who doesn't want to go through years and years of you know hanging up posters and you know folding up flyers and handing out flyers and all these kind of things um, until you come to a point where you can actually um, influence um, or you know be on a list or something which is do something. That is an issue we addressed after the 2017 election as well, um, especially um, in some of the lender, it's, it's a bit more problematic. Bavaria is definitely one of it, where it's, you know, where you can see that lists are not filled by people who are really prominent or popular or successful, but the people who are quite, you know, busy, busy bees for the party. Um, however, how to change that? Um, I think there's another difficulty coming up now that we do see, you know, the effects of Corona crisis, but also refugee crisis and potentially even climate crisis. I'm not so sure about this. People seem to, they, they want to have a kind of a retreat, kind of something they, you know, they can go back and, and lean back, which is basically their home, which is the local level. It's not the federal level anymore and it's not the lender level anymore. So it's becoming more and more important to actually people, you know, so being on the ground are, be, are, are becoming more and more important as well. So I think the party, um, especially, you know, Lars Klingbeil um, <laughs> as the sec general secretary, he needs to reform the party, which, is, which he is trying to do, which I think he does quite successfully, um, and making sure that young talents um, are becoming more heard um, and they have more opportunity to present themselves and also to have a 
bigger focus on the local level and not just the state or um, uh, federal level. I think that's his job. And I do think he, he understands that, you know, there is an issue, but it's hard to break structures which have grown over 50, 60, 100 years. Yes, yes, thank you. Jana, Ed, did you want to address that or uh, other ideas? Um, uh, only very briefly. I mean, one is, one is um, uh, you end up up in this vicious circle, don't you? As you as you as you lose votes, um, you, you probably lose opportunities for new parliamentarians, and it makes it that bit harder. Um, uh, and I'm sure I'm sure I'm sure that's right. Um, uh, and also, direct mandates potentially uh, w would have offered more opportunities there uh, than, than list places. So, so, so definitely did something there. Maybe we shouldn't overegg it, uh, though. I mean, of course, one of the uh, SPD's most prominent uh, leadership figures at the moment is Kevin Kunert. Um, I think uh, two days ago in Bonn, the current uh, leader of the uh, Young Socialists was selected as a parliamentary candidate. So, um, it, it's it's you know it, we shouldn't we shouldn't overegg it. It's not just the case that uh, everyone being being chosen for to run for elected office. Uh, is 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 a chap uh, over 60 um and indeed uh, having just experienced the uh, cdu's uh, uh, leadership contest um the spd wouldn't be unique in um in having some of these demographic challenges great great um there was a, a an early question about possible lessons from the uk from corbyn jeremy corbyn and, and corbynomics in particular um any thoughts from either of you about lessons from the UK? Uh, thanks. I mean, uh, I think, uh, you know, in all honesty, um, again, a big challenge um, for social democrats, which is a soul of the hills, is, is around um, economic, economic credibility. Um, and, and it's particularly difficult at the moment. It's particularly difficult at a time when uh, major budget uh, budget deficits have to be run in order to deal with the pandemic. So, you know, I don't know what that looks like. And I think, I think there's a really difficult balance for Olaf Scholz to tread here, because if he goes in with a very expansive fiscal policy at a time when, um, you know, the German public will probably be quite concerned uh, about the uh, level of the level of debt uh, and, and where the CDU is, is pressing for a timely return to the debt break, then that might uh, unsettle some, uh, but, but at the same time, simply going fiscal hawk at the moment would look ridiculous. So I, I think it's very difficult, um, and I'm not sure there's, a, there's an easy answer, particularly in, in the current context, uh, but Jana's reflections be really well. Well, I mean, you're right. People are unsettled because, you know, of, because of the level of debt, but at the same time, People are also unsettled by the uh, Investitionsstau, um, how to say, um, uh, we don't spend enough money for infrastructure, health, um, social, the social system. So they are quite unsettled by both things. So investing at the one hand, but also now um, the level of debt yeah, at the other hand. So it is, I, well, let, let's see what the next couple of months will bring. I think the pandemic situation might change everything. I, it's so hard to, to tell at the moment. Thank you. There, there are a number of questions that from a variety of angles um, get to this, this challenge of finding a, a spot, an, a, an opening, a niche on the, on the party spectrum. Um, and one of the questions puts a sharper point on it, having to do with what strategic choices are left for the SPD. Um, would either of you care to examine that question or build on some of your earlier points about strategic choices? Well, I tried to make that point at the very end. I mean, Merkel not running for um, office again is nothing every single German now has in mind at this point of the year. So I do think there will be a change once people really realize, oops, um, it won't be Merkel, but it will be Söder or Laschet, or whoever it might be. That's one thing. So um, this strong need for leadership at the moment might not be fulfilled with um, 
a conservative candidate at the same time um so that so that is one i, I think one real point of strategy to, to how can we basically get the Merkel vote because we do know that quite a lot of Germans voted for um, the Conservatives not because of the Conservatives but because of Angela Merkel so where will they go I mean they won't go to the AFD um, they, they might go to the Greens or they might you know go to the, to the Social Democrats so if we you can draw these kind of um, people who do need leadership and voted for, for Merkel, um, I, I do think that that is quite a big ground. The other thing is they definitely need to um, find one way of dealing with the big challenges for the future, the next big crisis or the, you know, we are in the middle of a climate crisis and people do know that. So we can't be greener than the Greens, fair enough, but you know, you have to, you have to deal with this topic. Um, and if it's only in order to not lose more ground in four, eight, uh, 12 years. So I do think it's the strategy of trying to get, you know, the Merkel voters and also um, becoming more, pro becoming the focal point of progressive thinking again. Ed, do you care to address that? Um, um, yeah, two, two quick reflections. Um, maybe maybe three quick thoughts. I mean, it, w w one is, um, as Sianna's hinting, I mean, I suppose the, the almost the last hope um, is that as people realise uh, Angela Merkel isn't standing uh, again, um, there is space for um, you know someone who's been an effective finance minister uh, to. Uh, to, 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 to look like, you know, and, and, and all actually, it's very popular and has been, has been very effective to, to, to pick up some of those votes. And as uh, one colleague alluded to in the, in the Q&A as well, maybe gain a bit more credit for coalition successes. I must admit, again, it's all, it's all, it's, it's a hunch. I, I find it difficult to, to see that happening. Um, it, it seems to me that, you know, the hope that suddenly people will, uh, you know, from one day to the next think, oh, Merkel's going and now I'm going to vote for the Social Democrats again. I, I think it feels that feels unlikely, but you never know. And of course, it may it may you know in a in a in a party system which is so fragmented, moving from fifteen or seventeen percent to twenty three, twenty four could really change things. Um, there are different strategic options. I mean, I mentioned Green Left. I mentioned Denmark. There may be others. Um, I suppose the worst thing to do is nothing at all and not to make a strategic choice. I think that's my that's my argument. You know, there'd, there'd be you, you win something, you lose something. Maybe you can test out which of these models will work. But if you do nothing at all uh, and you uh, try and, and 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 try and play to different different galleries, or you have in a while Eskin trying to secure up one flank and then you have Scholz securing another, then you end up with a cacophony of noise which uh, which pleases no one. Um, I mean, the, la the last thing, uh, and it's interesting, and maybe maybe it's a slight difference from uh, where, where Jano, Jano is hinting. If we look at where the SPD does well in the lender, are there any lessons there? Um, and in general, um, in general, that's been actually, it's been good incumbency. It's been about leading coalitions. So maybe it just doesn't fly in a current context, but certainly it will be progressive yet, yet pragmatic, often quite a Quite a forward-leaning stance, certainly being associated with the topic of investment that Jana mentioned. But yeah, it's, it's really, really difficult these strategic questions, uh, and there's no one right answer. I'm just sure that do nothing is the wrong answer. May I may, may I add one thing because we haven't talked about the Greens. They need to have a um, candidate candidate as well. So um, you know, if you follow my point that people are looking for leadership at the moment, um, and Laschet won't be able to you know be that kind of leadership um we do have the greens um on hand well it could be harbeck which i strongly believe is not the leader the germans are looking for um or potentially annalena baerbock which i'm not so sure about leader so um you know there might be a sweet uh, spot in in this vacuum map leaves thank you thank you yana um I, I wanted to just throw in a, a question a, a bit more about the programmatic issues here. Um, recently, the SPD identified four major issues, um, fighting climate, electrification of cars, digitalization, healthcare. 
Um, Yana, you mentioned you know public opinion concerns, and and I'm I'm just wondering um, where the the so-called red thread is, and if there's less of an appetite for progressive politics in Germany at the moment, and that's a big if. Um, why that might be, um, and and what that implies for the SPD going forward, how to maybe recapture that social justice ideological undercurrent when it, right now there may be something else that is on people's minds. I, I don't know. Maybe getting to this question of program and social justice progressivism. Um, any thoughts, either of you? Um, uh, while well, well, Jana's thinking, uh, I mean, a, a couple of quick thoughts, if I may. I mean, one, uh, one, one is that a theme which 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 the SPD has tried to mobilise on, uh, and I've said okay, it's happened. It's happened in the UK as well. Is around precarious work, and for whatever reason, that hasn't flown yet. Um, and it doesn't seem to gain much traction. So, you know, that should be a good topic. Um, uh, and, and, and arguably it's something which is more exposed uh, in, in times of crisis. Um, whether that is because precarious uh, workers are less likely to uh, to vote or be politically engaged, or whether it's because um, uh, uh, the current uh, generation of SPD politicians maybe lacks a little bit of credibility in that area because of the hearts reforms, I'm, I'm not sure, but that's, that's that's um that's a challenging a challenging area i mean if i can uh, just um contrast two possibilities which also flesh out this this argument i'm making about about making choices an issue which hasn't worked and an issue which has um it, after the refugee crisis it seemed to me that the social democrats response or was quite cautious because they didn't want to be kind of full on uh we welcome we welcome refugees. Um, we need to be fully supportive. We're completely there with those who are who are helping out because because uh, there was a feeling that many Germans were perhaps unsettled by the uh, number of refugees who come to Germany and, and that that would leave one flank open. Uh, but at the same time, they they also weren't going to go kind of full on be, be, being very critical of the government. Uh, and again, there was a bit of that was a bit of neither fish nor fowl. That was one where um, it, it didn't there wasn't really a clear argument uh, and ended up in no man's land. By contrast, I thought one area which was a really interesting choice and where a choice was made, and it was a contentious choice, um, uh, but, but, at but at least they come off the fence, was on um, subsidies for uh, car manufacturers of cars with combustion engines, uh, where in the end the SPD really put its foot down and said that uh, subsidies would not be made available as part of uh, coronavirus uh, recovery funds um, to for, for, for car manufacturers ma manufacturing combustion engines. And that was criticised by uh, SPD politicians close to uh, the car lobby, industry lobby, Stefan Weyer, um, Sigmar Gabriel. But it did feel like that was a clear bit of positioning on an issue where they might have hedged. Um, so, so that would be a, a sort of more positive example. Thank you, Ed. Well, so, social justice always played a big role um, for the party. And when you think about the 2017 election, social justice was, you know, the program. However, it was only the claim. There, there was no program behind it. And I do believe we still face a little bit of the same issue. So I don't believe that they need to spell out every policy, you know, when it, when, and all of the uh, different things. But what they need to, for, for themselves, need to get clear is where do we want to go and how do we actually want to live together? I mean, how do we as a society, what is our, what is our, our vision for a German society? How do we actually want to face all those um, crises we are facing at the moment? You, you've mentioned it, di digitalization, um, healthcare, climate, um, all these kind of things. It, it, I mean, what will it end up with it will be a fight for resources it will all be about distribution and of course it will be about social justice but they haven't quite found a way of you know telling me as a voter this is where we want to go and these are three four five um topics we need to address i don't know what kind of direction they are heading towards at the moment and i mean as you said Ed, and those um lender like malutaya and um, 
she, she was always quite clear um, on the refugee crisis where she stands, and she was quite successful with that. She wasn't, you know, falling from left to right, from left to right, like Sigma Gapia did. Great, thank you. Um, there are a number of questions emerging uh, in the direction of foreign policy and security policy, but before we get to that, still keeping with progressive politics, social justice, and some of those programmatic issues, um, uh, uh, questioners raised the, uh, the issue of diversity, uh, different kinds of diversity, and how the SPD uh, might position itself or make it its position more distinctive when it comes to diversity. Do either of you have any thoughts or is this something the party is, is not, not necessarily uh, intent on addressing or, or isn't doing very effectively? Well, to be honest, um, the SPD is not doing better or worse than any other party in Germany. I mean, most parties in Germany Maybe, you know, let, let's uh, talk about the Greens at the moment, but with the others, well, they are white, they are male, um, and they are old. Um, so diversity isn't that big um, in the SPD, that's, that's true. Um, however, I do believe they have to be more diverse, not only on, you know, those points, but also most of the uh, candidates in Parliament are highly educated. Um, well, that there is is a lack of you know representation in Germany, but that holds for all parties, to be honest. Okay. All right. Then um, let's let's move on a little bit to the the direction of foreign policy. Um, Jeff Rathke asked a question about um, the SPD's uh, traditional strength. Um, being, you know, anti-nuclear weapons, the withdrawal of nuclear weapons from German soil. Um, do you expect this to play a prominent role in this election campaign? And does it hold promise as a way to draw in voters? Try to get that one first. Um, a, a couple of quick reflections. I mean, I, one is I, I agree with your opening comment, about, and I think Jeff put it in his question about the likelihood of um, uh, foreign policy playing a role in the election. I, I, I suspect it won't, um, other things being equal. Um, uh, and if anything, uh, but of course, there have been exceptions in 2002 with Iraq, uh, with such an exception. Uh, and, and who knows, maybe if Trump had won it, there might have been things that happened that gave it a greater salience, but I don't really see it. Um, I have to say the, the Greens uh, seem to me completely at ease with very pragmatic positioning on many areas of foreign policy. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm not, I, I, and I mean, maybe is there, is there room space to the left there? I, I, I mean, I, I find that difficult to believe that that would really motivate uh, many voters to peel away from, from the Greens, to be honest. I mean, one thing which I've noticed just in recent times uh, and which was interesting was the Greens uh, being um, a lot more forthright about Russia. Um, and I have to say, if anything, this is an area, <coughs> excuse me, where I, I think the SPD's position is rather uncomfortable. Uh, and, and if anything, there, there could be some trouble actually uh, in looking uh, defensive of an increasingly um, assertive and, um, uh, uh, and rather destructive uh, Russian state. Um, uh, and uh, if anything, there could be a little bit further to fall on that one. Yana, do you have any thoughts about that? Okay, all right. Um, there was a, a, a question about whether it makes any difference strategically to the SPD, uh, you know, who the chancellor candidate will be for the CDU, whether Lachat or Söder, or C, CSU. Um, that's an interesting question, moving somewhat sharply away from foreign policy, perhaps, but um, would it make a difference to the way the SPD approaches the election and, and how? What, what comes to your minds? Well, I strongly hope so and believe so. Um, Zura is a very different personality than Laschet, and Laschet is much more um, the guy who is who could potentially be seen as a small copy of Angela Merkel, but um, it's a smaller copy. So. Um, I've mentioned that before, I don't believe he'd be um, 
strong opponents, or the strongest opponents. Um, Söder, on the other hand, um, is seen um, from most people as being quite a good leader. And at the moment, he's, you know, really, you know, being forward with the whole corona um, situation. So he's quite, um, he, he, he kind of, he's quite strong. Um, but at the same time, he's also one of the, you know, ugly conservative faces. So I believe there will be a totally different approach when you, you know, try to attack uh, Zura, you will be much more against this whole conservative right wing, blah, 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 um, thing about the conservatives. But when you, you know, try to address um, Laschet, you will be much more on a um, pragmatic, um, almost on a policy level where you discuss and he, he won't be stable enough to hold the discussion. So I'm pretty sure this will be very different approaches. Um, if I may, I, I, mean, I, I completely agree with what Jana said, and, and, and I'm not sure what, if I was a social democrat in Germany what I would wish for, because Laschet looks like the, probably the, in some ways the less effective candidate um, of the two, um, uh, but uh, offers less uh, uh, sort of space to attack um, uh, because of a clearly uh, sort of centrist uh, disposition and, and presentation. Zuda might offer a little bit more, but perhaps is the more effective candidate. Um, the, the one thing, the one thing with that though, uh, is that I, I think maybe people uh, are, are assuming that Zuda would end up being perceived in the way that Edmund Stoiber and Lee Franz Josef Strauss as previous CSU chancellor candidates were received. Um, and to me, he looks to have done quite a good job at um, positioning his image just that little bit differently. I'm, I'm not sure uh, that, that the kind of um, out of touch, arrogant Bavarian line of attack, which uh, which, which, which did work uh, against Schreiber, um would necessarily fly to the same extent against Zuda. Um, he, he seems to have sort of created a, a persona which is uh, a, a lot less um, a lot less abrasive. Uh, uh, and, and which may 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 yet help. Thank you both. Um, there is a, a question about about regional politics, um, about um, about the role of voters in the East. Um, trying to to paraphrase here, but um, you know Schroeder's reelection in two thousand two was due in part to support in the East. Um, is is this something that the SPD might might think a bit about in its um, strategy this year? Well, I mean, the East of Germany is quite interesting when it comes to who is actually the Volkspartei here, um, and it's not. It's not necessarily um, the SPD anymore. It's um, you know, it's it's the left. Um, the left is the focal point of interest. It's not it's not the SPD. So you need to give um, voters actually an actual reason to, to vote for another left party, which is almost the the smaller sister, um, the small tanta of uh, of the left party. Um, plus, there is a second issue. Um, well, there's. There are still not enough SPD members in the East who could actually run a campaign. So, I mean, this sounds a little bit funny, but it, it is a real issue. So you just don't have enough people standing there, um, you know, talking to voters and just being present. So the East will be a huge issue this time round. And if the party doesn't reform, um, it will be an even bigger issue in the upcoming election in four and eight years. Just, I, I completely agree with everything uh, Jana said, and certainly Jana's done a, a brilliant piece of work on uh, reunited Germany, which uh, people can read Germany is, is definitely worth digging out. Um, but um, uh, I, rolling the clock foot, there is definitely higher electoral, um, there was, I think it still is higher electoral volatility uh, in the east, so maybe you know, maybe there are some opportunities there. To be honest, doesn't feel that promising um, this time around. But I don't know. Playing, playing a thought experiment. If Manuel Schwesig became the party leader, um, if Germany's and Eastern Germany's economy didn't do so well 
uh, under Chancellor Zuda and the Green Coalition partners. Um, could there be an opportunity there in, in, in four and a half years' time? Uh, that, that feels um, that little bit more interesting. Great, thank you. Um, managing the Q&A is a little more challenging than I anticipated, but um, it's skipping back a little bit to how the fate of other parties might impact the SPD's fortunes this election. Um, there was an early question from Thomas Lancaster about um, the FDP and how its fate um, might play out vis-a-vis uh, -vis the SPD or how the SPD's fate might be affected by the FDP, um, especially perhaps given the chancellor candidate uh, uh, Schultz uh, and, and his more neoliberal profile. Um, any, any thoughts from either of you taking a, a zigzag back to uh, the party spectrum and niches issues? Well, I mean, the liberals, they, at the moment, they're just not present at all. So um, <laughs> they might affect everything by not managing the 5% hurdle, which is not likely to be frank. But, you know, it's not that they are going to play a big role as they played, you know, in the past while it was a three-party system. Um, they struggle so much with themselves at the moment and with their party leadership. Um, I'm, I'm really excited how it's um, going in the next couple of months, but I do not believe that the fate in the Liberals is um, changing anything for the, the um, Social Democrats at the moment. No. Agreed. Agreed, Ed. Okay. All right. Um, I, I hope that I have done some justice to collating some of these questions. Um, there's just one, one more topic that I don't think we've really touched upon. It's back to this question of, of the SPD's social justice progressivist sort of profile. Um, and it's a, a question about um, the unions and the role of, of um, you know, workers and, and not yet being raised in the discussion. Um, will it be raised? by the SPD and will it be raised any differently? Is, is, is something um, changed enough that the role of unions and um, their policy preferences will somehow be less or will be eclipsed by other things? Do either of you want to address that? Uh, 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 only a, a very brief observation. I mean, it, um, it, I mean, it seems, seems to me, you know, the links between uh, the, the SPD and the unions are you know, actually extremely cordial. A senior SPD politician remarked to me not too long ago, you know, they, they, he couldn't remember them being better. Um, and unions are clearly very happy uh, about a number of the uh, policies that the SPD secured in the Grand Coalition. But, but the problem is the SPD is still at 15% in the polls. So I'm not sure um, there's a kind of silver, silver bullet there really, uh, which is going to, uh, gonna, go, going to help them very much. And I, I imagine would also pull in older voters or keep older voters interested, but maybe wouldn't be as successful as pulling in younger and newer voters. No. Well, um, Eric has reappeared, which must be a signal we are we're close to the end. Um, I, I thank you both, Yana and Ed, for your uh, thoughtful answers. And, um, and I'll, I'll turn it back over to Eric. And thank you, audience participants, for your thoughtful questions. Yeah, we're coming up at uh, one, so I just wanted to conclude today's event by thanking um, Ed and Yana, as well as uh, Jen for moderating. It was a very inspiring and um, uh, I think insightful uh, discussion. Uh, I'd like to uh, remind everybody that our next event in the series is going to be on March 1st uh, with Louise Davidson Schmick and Sarah Williarty, who will be talking about the AFD, the Alternative uh, for Germany. And then um, other events will include the Green Party and perhaps some of the other um, smaller parties as well. Well, the left and the FDP. But anyway, um, thank you on behalf of the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies, as well as our partners one more time, the Aston Center for Europe, the International Association for the Study of German Politics, and the BMW Center for German and European Studies at Georgetown University. Um, so um, we will see you soon. Uh, thanks to everybody, and uh, have a good day. Awesome. Thanks.